Robin Dan, I shall know him. Taking our Bibles this morning, turn to Philippians chapter number one in your Bible, if you can follow along. Philippians chapter number one. Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, and Philippians. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 1, read the first six verses of our text. You can follow along in your Bibles as we read. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always, in every prayer of mine, for you all making a request with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, would you attune our hearts to the truth of your word just now. Lord, it's so easy to be distracted and to be led astray by thoughts of the flesh, by legitimate pressures of the hour, by other things that could serve that purpose. So, Father, would you just superintend as we yield to you this hour together, looking uh, to these truths that we'll extract from your word. We thank you for the folk in this room. We know there are needy people here. That would include the one standing on this side of the, the pulpit and would extend to everyone in every part of this room. If we'd be real honest uh, before you and with ourselves, we uh, should all acknowledge that just now, so we do. And so we ask for the fullness of the Spirit, and we ask for the, uh, the Christ of eternity to dwell in our hearts uh, by faith now, as touching the thing that we're going to take up from the Philippians chapter 1. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's get right to the point, if we could. Verse number six is our key verse in, in the text. We have a lot of things we have done this morning, a lot that we have to do yet. And let's uh, move forward quickly if we could. The, the key verse is the sixth verse. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it into the day of Jesus Christ. It was probably two years ago, I would guess. Not sure, but approximately two years ago, I had used this verse as a devotional thought. I'm called upon to give uh, devotions and, and uh, different capacities throughout the, the week. Uh, four days a week I have devotions uh, with our, our faculty and staff in various combinations with Deltona Christian School, have uh, other connections and usually try to give a challenge to thought. And I use this particular verse from Philippians 1.6. It probably was for faith outreach when I used this and Velma Taylor was present and she lit up when I used this verse. And it resonated with her, and she had some comments to make. And uh, I remember that. You say, well, it's just like a, a five-minute devotional before we go out and go visiting or calling. And, and you remember that? I do. I do. It's something when, when you strike truths from God's Word and you see uh, someone light up. We know that it has been significant to, to them in the past, but I remember that, and we're, we're sort of thinking a lot about Velma these days, aren't we? The family is, I know, and will continue to, and we all will in, in particular ways. So I thought it would be appropriate to use this passage for our sermon this morning, and there's, there's something here. There's really something great and powerful here. We find three tenses in this uh, comment that Paul addressed under, under inspiration of God's Spirit to the believers at Philippi, the Philippians. There is the past, that he which hath begun a good work in you. And there is obviously the, the, the present, and that's the occasion for him writing this, and some, some other things that we know from other portions of Scripture that point to his present relationship with them. And then, of course, even the, the future will perform it uh, until the day of, of Jesus Christ. And uh, I love it when you see the, the tenses that transcend all of our existence. 
It's uh, times like this when we uh, are confronted with, with our mortality and with uh, someone that, that leaves us and goes into the, to the realm of eternity. And someone asked me yesterday prior to the uh, memorial service, the homeworking service for Velma says, do you suppose that, that Velma and Pastor Don have gotten together yet? Oh yeah, I'm sure they have. And I, I think they've probably visited for a couple of hundred years already. And whoever said that sort of looked at me real strange. I said, really? She's in the realm of eternity. And time's not counted there like it is here. Uh, God dwelling in, in His uh, eternal state uh, is not bound by, by time. And so what a wonderful thought it is that, uh, yes, those gone on before us are experiencing things that, that we can't. So it makes us stop and think about some serious things. In a way, we're prisoners of time, aren't we? We're trapped here for the moment. And we, we shall escape, all of us, sooner or later, in one way or another, through death or through the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. But when we see an outline of the past and the present and the future, uh, it's a particular use. It's, it's very useful for us, and it uh, brings encouragement, it brings guidance, and it brings help. And so here we are in Philippians 1, 6 this morning. Let's look at the overview of this passage that we read, if we could, and particularly of the sixth verse. And the overview is uh, that of progressive sanctification. Uh, you say, oh man, here we go, Sunday morning, and he's going to throw out a great big long theological term. Uh, here, uh, here it is. Uh, well, let's just break it down where we can uh, nibble at it uh, yeah, pleasantly, if we could, this morning, uh, this work of sanctification. Sanctification is the process whereby God sets us apart. After conversion, after salvation, when we've come to faith in Christ, when we've been saved, when we've been born again, we've, when we've been redeemed, and when we've been brought into the family of God, a process is, is begun. It's called scripturally sanctification. And it is an ongoing process. Now, there's some, some wrong views that people espouse of religion concerning that. There is a view that sanctification is instantaneous. And so that as soon as you're saved, he just sanctifies you through and through. Now, positionally, we know that's true because our sins are forgiven. We're a child of God. Uh, we are made not enemies anymore, but friends, children in God's family. However, practically, we're speaking about where we live. We're speaking about today and tomorrow and in the days which we inhabit just now. Uh, progress, the, the sanctification is a, a process. It begins, but it is ongoing. It is a, a work that never stops. It's an ongoing work. Well, Velma's work is complete. Now, how do we know that? Well, the verse says, uh, He will perform it until the day of, of Jesus Christ. Now, specifically the day of Jesus Christ is the day when the Lord Jesus Christ will return for us and when we be gathered to Him uh, at the rapture of the church. However, those that fall asleep in Christ, that die physically and go into His presence uh, before that time, uh, will have experienced that completion already. Now, I know that again... There are those that would wrongly teach a, a Bible doctrine, so they say, of soul sleep. So that when you die, you go to sleep and you're not conscious of anything. But it's not scriptural. You're very conscious, both in heaven and in hell. There is a conscious existence. There's the conscious rewarding of the saved, the blessed in Christ. We know that from the Bible. Uh, there is a conscious punishment of the lost. We have examples of that, of the rich man that lifted up his eyes in hell being torments in the flame and begged for a drop of water to quench his thirst. And so there, there is a completion. Uh, we know that it is ongoing during this life. So if you're here this morning and, and you're saved, you're in Christ, uh, you are in that phase now of that progressive, that ongoing work of, of sanctification. And we see that plainly. Uh, secondly, we jump right to the point if we could. There is, he has begun a good work. We'll think of the past tense if we could. How is that work begun? Well, it is begun with 
you coming to faith in Christ through the new birth, through salvation. Now, salvation is a particular point in time. Uh, again, there are those that would, would say, well, I've, I've always been saved, and yet no one has ever always been saved. Now, you may have been always around the things of God, and you, have, you may have always been in a position, in a spot where you were instructed and where you heard concerning salvation. You may have been um, born and, and raised in a, in a wonderful family uh, that espouses the truth of God's Word, but you've never always been saved because there comes a point in time, there must come a point in time in which we receive, we accept, we trust by faith the Lord Jesus Christ. So the beginning of this work is at salvation. And so if you are here and, and not sure of that, or if you're perhaps fuzzy or trusting something else, if your dependence is on anything, uh, any other pedigree, religiously or otherwise, then that new work can begin in you today, right now, by coming to Christ by faith, uh, confessing your sin and asking him to do for you what you cannot do for yourself ever, ever in a million uh, eternities, and that is to save you from your sin. So that begins uh, the work. And I might mention it at this time that as uh, touching the beginning of the work of, of sanctification or growth or setting you apart for God's purpose and service, uh, some people begin that and they grow rapidly. They get with God's program real quickly. And I love to see that. I love to see it when someone gets saved and they're eager to embrace the things of God and they're, they're hungry for the truths of the Word of God and they just believe it. And in simple childlike faith, they, they espouse what God wants them to have. And so as uh, they, they begin this work, it, it progresses, which brings us to the next point. And that is the, the current working. He who has begun a good work in you will perform it. It assumes the ongoing work. And we know that it was a wonderful work as viewed in the Philippian believers. Now, what is this work that was ongoing in them? Well, they'd been instructed, been taught. In fact, if you read the book of Philippians, you'll find no doctrinal errors that Paul had to straighten out. Now, that's not like some other people that he wrote, some other churches. They had some extreme and some drastic errors and some, some things that had to be dealt with, some sins that had to be taken care of, and some things that were out of order. But not so with the Philippians. Uh, they had it together spiritually. They had the right structure of leadership in their church. They were responding right to that leadership. He commended them for that both here and in the book of 2 Corinthians. And so this, this work was, was that of cooperation with them. And could I sidestep this point just for a moment to observe this, that once you're saved, uh, then there is a partnership between you and God in which you must, you must assist God in what he's doing. Uh, you must cooperate with him or he won't do it above and beyond your will. He allows this process to be a product of a function of your will. You can decide, you can say yes or no to God. And so he needs your partnership in this. It brings us to a question I'd like to ask with regard to this, this second phase, which is the present tense. Is he currently working in your life? Is God working in your life right now? Well, now, before you answer it quickly with uh, a cut and dried answer like this, you may say, well, God's working in everybody's life. Of course, he's working in my life. Now, that's not what I'm trying to get at. I'm asking you specifically, is God working in specifics in your life? Can you put your finger where God is working right now in your life? Now remember this, that God works through a variety of, of different means. And we could ask ourselves, what does God have at his disposal in order to, to work with us? What's available to God to work with us? And the answer is everything. He's omnipotent. He's all powerful. He's omniscient. He knows everything. In fact, he knows just where he may touch you. We think we know ourselves, but God's word says that we don't. Jeremiah says that we don't know ourselves. The heart is deceitful and wicked. Who can know it? But God does. 
And so God has available to him and he does use uh, various things. And we recently heard a discussion in our, our Sunday school class that uh, the complaint is, is often made about life. It's not fair. And I'll, I'll just repeat what, uh, what my parents repeated to me. Well, son, life ain't fair. <laughs> it's just not. We know that. It's not fair. You know what a cowboy told me one time out in, in Utah on a cowboy ride? We were out riding. He, was, he had all these little fancy stories and sayings. He said, uh, he says, you know, my dad used to tell me, son, life's not fair because if it were, the horse would ride half the time. <laughs> now, that's cowboy humor, <laughs> cowboy wit. <laughs> but it illustrates a point, doesn't it? Life's not fair. It, it's not. It uh, doesn't claim to be. It can't be as long as it's touched by sin. As long as there's the stuff we got to deal with, it never can be fair, and we'd like for it to be, but it's not. But there is a God, and regardless of how we perceive the working of God, He has available to us, or to Him, those things that He uses as He works with us. Now, it is in this process of sanctification where He is refining and training and teaching and developing us in our Christian life that he uses these things. Now, I don't know about you. I can speak for myself. Uh, I'm hard-headed. I know that you wouldn't be that way. But did you know that we as, as hard-headed human beings often need specific things to help us along the, the road, don't we? Now, it's just like this. When, when you're raising children, who are God's children, but when we think about our human children, uh, you, you think about your children, especially when they get up about sixth grade and a little bit more, you just sit down and say, now this and this and this is the way it is, and that's the way it has to be. And they say, oh, great, Dad, I'm, I'm glad that's the way it is. We'll do that just for the rest of our life. Is that the way it works? <laughs> now, why are you laughing? <laughs> <laughs> because you weren't that way, and I wasn't that way, and they're not that way. It usually, it usually, well, well why can't I do that? And soon say, okay, go ahead. And when it blows up in their face, they say, oh, now I understand. It is dangerous sometimes to learn that way. There are some things that ought not be learned by trial and error because they're devastating, they're crushing, they're destructive to children. Uh, that's why children just need to listen to their parents and say, yes, dad said it and that's it. I'll take his word for it. I will until I can understand better. And you know, God knows this about raising his children. So this process currently ongoing involves him using some things to get our attention. And he does it for all of us. None is exempt from this. Now, I wish that we were just uh, sweet, obedient children and we can sit down and say, yes, Father, yes, Father, whatever you say, Father, right away, uh, I'm, I'm at your bidding and we'll do that. But it's not usually that way. It can be from time to time. And the further we go, the easier it is to respond like that, but usually isn't. So is he currently working in your life? Now, I can just speak in generalities without addressing anyone particularly because the message is not designed to do that. But you ask in your heart of hearts, is God working currently in my life in a particular area? And if he is, are you cooperating with him? Are you resisting? Are you bowing up, as we would say in the South? Uh, are you holding out on, on God? Now, he, he will prevail. He's God. And one way or another, eventually he's going to have his, his way. Uh, but you can make it hard. You can make it easy. And the sooner you get with the program of, of God's in your life and that you comply with what he's doing currently, then we can be recipients of the blessing after that. Uh, he is working in our lives currently. So that brings us to the, the next point. How's it going? How's it going in your life right now? now? Years ago, I'm probably dating myself again by doing this, there was an old commercial on uh, TV, black and white TV, where there was a, a mother and a, and a daughter, and I think maybe they were in the kitchen cooking or something, and the girl protested. She said, but mother, I'd rather do it myself. How many of you remember that? Okay, all right. <laughs> you do, don't you? But mother, I'd rather do it myself. Well, that was a play on the tendency of, of young people to say, I can do it, I can handle it. Uh, but there was the mother there who was ready to offer some instruction. But I ask you this morning, 
So how's it going? How's it going? Have you told God, I'd rather go it on my own. I can handle this. I can do this. I'm capable of that. I can make my own decisions. Uh, I, I know what's going to happen. If you're doing that, remember who you're saying that to. You're saying that to the God of eternity. God knows, and we don't. We need, we need wisdom. James says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not. Let him ask of God. How's it going? How's this process going? How is this work that God has begun at salvation and currently is ongoing in your life while we're alive, while we're still on planet Earth? Uh, how is it going? Well, it reminds me of a passage in the next chapter. If you're in Philippians, just flip over one page perhaps, or maybe on the same page in your Bible. Philippians 2 Look at two verses, 12 and 13. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Now, that dovetails with verse 6 of the first chapter, doesn't it? God has begun a good work, but look at the nature of this work. It's further explained in this verse. In verse number 13, For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. The two things that are mentioned in, in Philippians 2, 13, and that is to will and to do. To will and to do. Okay, what is it to will? That speaks of decisions that are made. You know, when we think of the, the will of God, uh, we think of God's purpose and plan and His decisions for us and the things, uh, the, the way that God uh, wants things to go in our life. The will of God. If we say, what is the will of God concerning such and such a decision? It is what He wants to happen in that area. So this work that is ongoing in us that the sixth verse of the first chapter talks about it involves the will of God, the will of God. Now, the will of God is easily known. It's clearly seen from Scripture, and He will clearly reveal even in finer details what His will is. But there's something about the will of God. It must be yielded to and submitted to. You must agree with it and say, yes, Lord, not my will, but yours. Now, that hurts our human will, doesn't it? Because a human will wants to say, I'm tough, I can handle it, I'll make my own decisions, I'll do what I want to do. And God says, you won't. You'll mess it up every time. That's already the verdict before the trial begins. So we yield, we surrender to the will of God, both to will and then secondly to do. Will speaks of direction and purpose and intelligence and the direction that God wants things to go. Secondly, to do. That speaks of, of a work that is done. That speaks of the power of the energy. Uh, I, I like to work personally. I, I do. Uh, I'm maybe in, in a way I'm a workaholic in, in certain, certain ways. Uh, maybe Garrett's figuring that out a, a little bit. Had him helping me the other day about some real tough things around the house. But I, I like to work. I like to build things. I like to tear things up. <laughs> Missing anything over here this morning? <laughs> Someone asked, when's it going back? I said, it ain't. Gone. That's it. And then there's the other side. And I'm anxious to get over here also. I like to work. I do. But did you know our forces that we have physically are limited? And as we graduate through life and stack up birthdays, we start watching how we expend those energies because they're in short supply at times. And soon we're not able to work and do the things we would like to. But think of this, we're connected with the God that is all powerful. And so when he says both to will and to do, he's going to go with us and do the work for us. And it's a partnership because he's going to use our energies and he's going to renew those energies and strengthen us as we mount up with wings as, as eagles. And he's going to help us not to faint in, in the efforts that we're cooperating with him in. Now, if we go it on our own, then we're limited to just the physical resources that we have in the flesh. And that's not much. And soon it's done and we fly away and it's over. So we ask the question, how's it going? 
How's it going with you? Is God working his will in your life? Can you consciously say, I am following the specific will of God? I know that I am. Not just in the generalities, but in the specifics. And secondly, are you drawing from his power to do what he wants you to do? We can look at some things. I can never do that. That's a good place to start because if we can't, then he can. And if we decide that, that we will let him do it through us, he will. He will. And God will just do wonderful things. Again, we read our text verse. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Is he working? If he is, how is he working? And if he is, how's it going in your life? I'd ask you one further question. Have you begun by trusting the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior? You may have heard about it. You may have been religious. You may have been exposed to it. But do you possess Jesus Christ as your Savior and God? Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. We're going to pray in just a moment. Extend the invitation.